All right, um, let's get started. Forgot my microphone. All right, let's get started. So um, today I want to talk about uh, linear models for classification and support vector machines. Uh, before we get started with this, um, maybe a small remark on the homework. So um, a couple of people asked about details about how they should visualize something or which columns uh, to encode in which way and mostly this is up to you. There's not usually one correct way. If you show, have a visualization that shows the coefficients, if you have a visualization that shows um, which parameters are good, like if it shows the essence of the data, it's a good visualization. If it doesn't, it's not a good visualization. And it's up to you to figure out how should you visualize that. You won't get like step-by-step -step instructions about this is the figure you have to use for this. Um, because I want you to think about these things yourself. Similarly for the encoding of the features, it's not always 100% clear uh, what is categorical and what is continuous. And um, as long as you do something reasonable, that's fine. If you do something that makes no sense at all, then we might subtract points. But it's not like if there's a number of bathrooms, uh, maybe you can go either way, but uh, we're not gonna subtract points for you deciding if it's continuous or categorical because both are sort of a reasonable way to go. What you do might, might um, influence how good your performance is, but uh, we don't really have a hard threshold on performance for the grading. So um, think about the decisions you make, but don't sweat it too much. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's, that was the main point. The next, so I know that uh, there was like some ambiguity in this homework. The, in the next homework, there will be way more ambiguity, uh, just so to warn you, so you should get used to it. Um, if you, like in about, what is it? eight months or something, you'll be at the company and there will be no instructions at all. And so you should try to work towards that. Um, all right, so let's get started with uh, linear models for binary classification. So these are um, in a sense quite similar to linear models for regression. Um, they also all have the same form, which is uh, usually you have your features of presentation X. Um, as with regression, you have some coefficients W, one coefficient for each feature, and you have some bias or offset B. And instead of having a regression response, which is just this W transpose X plus B, for classification, what we're looking at is uh, usually the sign of uh, this expression. So whether it's positive or negative. If it's positive, we say it's class one. If it's negative, we say it's class minus one. Geometrically, what this corresponds to is that W is the normal vector of a hyperplane. So here in this graph, I showed this in two dimensions. So here we have two features. One feature is X and one feature is Y. And so a hyperplane in 2D is just a line. So hyperplane means one dimension less than the ambient dim dimension. And uh, so what W is here, W is the normal vector on this line and B is how far um, from z zero did we push this line in direction of the normal vector. And so similarly in higher dimensions, W will always be the normal vector of the hyperplane. In three dimensions, the decision boundary will be a plane. In four dimensions, it will be whatever three-dimensional hyperplane and so on. And uh, as I said before with regression, in low dimension, this looks kind of not very flexible. Um, in higher dimension, this is actually very flexible and you can express many different things with it. Um, but one of the main ways to control complexity in a linear model is with the input dimension. And similar to the linear models for regression, the difference is um, between different models for classification is how do you pick the W and B on your training data set. So for regression, um, 
we had these two parts, a model um, fit, a data fitting term and a regularizer. We have a similar thing here, but uh, the data fitting term is not as straightforward as it was for regression. For regression, we used uh, least squares, and so ordinarily squares was our first approach, which is very natural. Um, in classification, so if we say our prediction is, um, uh, is the sign of this, the most natural way to measure whether our prediction is good is, is the prediction correct, which is called the zero one loss, which is basically an indicator that counts one every time you make a mistake. So that's basically um, like an unnormalized accuracy. That would be a very natural way saying, okay, I wanna minimize the mistakes. Um, however, if you look at this as a function of W transpose X, I skipped the B here, unfortunately, but if this is W transpose X, and um, then the function sign is this yellow function, which is the zero one loss. So assuming the true class is um, one, and you have the W transpose X on the X axis, the loss of, uh, sorry, if the true class is zero, um, well, sorry, if the true class is minus one, the loss of one is, uh, God damn it, <clears throat> sorry. Now, if the true class is one, the loss of having W transpose X be on the X axis is given as the yellow function. So if, you're po if you predict a positive number, the loss is zero. If you predict a negative number, the loss is one, you're misclassified. Um, the problem with this is this is a very, um, like hard to optimize function, it's not continuous, um, and it's not convex, which are two things we like in optimization. This means, this similar to what we saw with the number of uh, zeros in the coefficients for the, um, uh, in the, that we wanted for the lasso, this is impossible to optimize, basically. This is an NP-hard problem trying to optimize uh, this formula here is zero one loss. So the thing that you actually want to optimize the number of misclassifications is mathematically basically impossible to find the right coefficients. So, so we need something else. And um, as we did with uh, like L1 and Lasso, um, we can um, relax that and find a function that's better behaved. And the two functions that people commonly use are the hinge loss and the log loss. And these are um, drawn here. And so the hinge loss is this teal, and the log loss is this blue. And if you pick one of the, the or the other here, what you end up with is logistic regression and uh, support vector machines. And these are the two models I will talk about for most of today. So I will go over the motivations for both of these models, and they also have like separate motivations. But if you look at the math, the main reason why we want to use them is the thing that is the most natural is impossible, and both of these kind of um, approach uh, this thing that we actually care about, which is the zero one loss. So let's start with logistic regression. This actually has a quite nice um, interpretation, and also maybe something that we actually care about, which is um, the model the, uh, that we are um, assuming here is that what's called the log odds, which is the probability of the label being one given X divided by the probability of the label being zero given X and the log of those. So these are called the odds. The log is the log odds. We assume that this is a linear function. So we say, um, we, we use basically linear regression to approximate the log odds. Um, if you uh, rearrange this, then uh, you get, an, uh, using this assumption, the probability of y being one, um, given some data point x, works out at this guy, which is one over one plus uh, e to the minus w transpose x minus b. And this is uh, this logistic sigmoid that you can see here. Basically what it does is it takes these w transpose plus b and uh, which it goes from minus infinity to infinity, and it squashes it in between uh, zero and one, so you get a probability out. Um, then, once we have this approach, 
So now we're trying to model the probability of y being um, 0 or 1 instead of trying to predict uh, y being 0 or 1 directly. And so the loss that we get now, that we get from this is, okay, I should have uh, made it a step in between, which is now we try to maximize the probability of what we observe during the training set, on a training set. It's called maximum likelihood. So basically, we write down the probability of the label we observed, given the x, and we want this probability for the data that we actually observed to be maximum. We want the model to give the maximum probability to the things that we actually saw. And so um, what you see here is basically just this uh, uh, rearranged a little bit. Basically, it's p of y given x, and then you take the logarithm um, because then things are a little bit nicer behaved computationally. And so this is um, just the probability of the data you observe given this model p of y of x is this. If you then want to make a prediction, the way you usually make the prediction is you ask, is the probability of y being 1 greater than 0.5? If the probability of y being 1 is greater than 0.5, we say it's 1. If it's smaller than 0.5, we say it's 0. So basically, we threshold uh, here. If we do this, interestingly, in the end, this works out to be exactly the same uh, decision boundary that we had, uh, that I wrote down earlier. This just means um, if W transpose X plus B is greater than zero, then uh, P of Y given X will be greater than 0.5. You can see but at zero, the X exactly goes through 0.5. So if this expression is positive, we predict class one. If this expression is negative, we predict class minus one. Questions? Oh, um, I went from minimizing to maximizing because I flipped the sign, because people in optimization like to minimize things. So we are minimizing the negative probability. We could also maximize the positive probability. Um, and doing log or not log doesn't matter because it's a monotonous function. Um, so if we optimize the log or optimize the function itself, it doesn't matter. Yeah, people like to minimize better than like to maximize. It doesn't really matter if you put in a minus or not. All right, so this is sort of uh, plain logistic regression. Um, this is only the data fitting term that we talked about on Monday. So now we can also add, again, a regularizer to try to make our model be more simple. And we can do this the same way we did this for uh, Rich and Lasso. So we can add an L2 regularizer or an L1 regularizer. And again, they will... Um, um, make uh, the coefficients be smaller, um, both of them, where um, the L1 norm also means some of them will be exactly zero. So for historical reasons, this looks slightly different than the formula I showed on Monday, where basically C is um, we, the inverse to alpha. So here in scikit-learn or in many math books, the parameterization of this is you have a C, in front of the data fitting term instead of having an alpha in front of the regularizer. So if you multiply all of this with uh, what? C divided by, by if you mu multiply it by alpha divided by C, then you get the, the other formula. Um, cool. And so then um, again, this might be sort of slightly easier to optimize than the unregularized version, um, and um, you have the tuning parameter. Actually, in scikit-learn, um, by default, logistic regression is penalized, so C is equal to one by default. So by default, it uses the L2 regularization and C equal to one. Some people that come more from stats, that's surprising because um, logistic regression by default in statistics is unregularized. So 
I find here this regularization a little bit harder to understand than in um, in regression because uh, what does it mean for a normal vector to be shorter? Um, so that's um, yeah, I find this slightly less intuitive. There's a different way you can think about this, which is actually uh, comes from the interpretation of the dual, which says um, if you have a small c, that means lots of regularization, that limits the influence of each individual data point. So here, this is uh, the decision boundary of logistic regression on my favorite toy data set. And you can see that if c is very small, so c is small means alpha big means more regularization, then um, sort of you misclassify, assume this is a training set, you misclassify these two points on the training set, but you capture the overall data set pretty well. But, the re but these two data points are basically are limited in their influence on, um, on the model. If you increase C, so that means you decrease regularization, the model tries harder and harder to fit each individual point. And um, so you get, if you basically turn off regularization, you get this model, with na which now only misclassifies a single point. But you have like this very skewed decision boundary, which maybe doesn't reflect the overall data well anymore. So this is the way I'd like to think about regularization in um, binary classification, basically you limit the amount of influence each individual point has. And again, you could s say here, maybe the left-hand side looks kind of like a good model. Um, you can probably, it's very hard to underfit this data set because it's like very easy, but uh, the right-hand side, I would say it's probably overfit. All right, so this was all I wanted to say about uh, logistic regression, basically, and I want to come to support vector machines, which, as I said before, that's like, they're very, very similar, actually. So the motivation is different, um, but the mass is really quite similar. So the, like, this is the motivating example of support vector machines. It's not actually what sort of, uh, what the math uh, is in practice, but so the idea is that given these two points of groups, we want to find um, a linear model that separates them. So we want to find a line that separates them. In the objective for the support vector machine, um, a model is good if it has a large margin around the decision boundary. And the margin means how far can you go out from the line until you hit any of the training data points. So here, this green line separates perfectly the data into green and red, um, but there's not, not a big margin, there's not a lot of spa space around this line. The blue line is a little bit better, there's a little bit more space here, and the orange line, I think, is uh, the, well, it's actually not the optimum yet, but it's like the, the orange line is much better um, in that it has much more space around the decision boundary. So this is the um, motivation. In practice, usually there is no, um, no way to separate the data set linearly, in particular in lower dimensions. Very often there's no possibility to draw any line with um, any margin. And so what people use in practice is called the soft margin, um, SVM, where you let some points be, points be inside the margin. And basically you want as wide a margin as possible with as few points inside the margin. The objective function is the hinge loss, which is this guy here. And I've... I missed the parenthesis. Good. Um, so here, there should be a closing parenthesis here. I apologize. So the hinge loss, you, could, you saw this earlier, is basically uh, this guy. So this says if, um, if yi w transpose x plus b is um, smaller than 1, 
sorry, if it's if it's bigger than one, then uh, there is no loss. If it's smaller than one, there is a loss. And it, and it is within the margin, and the loss is um, proportional to this. So this product basically says something. So y i here would be plus mo one or minus one, and basically the product says um, I want uh, this guy to have the same sign as this guy. So if my y i is plus one, if the label is positive, I want w transpose x plus b also to be positive. But not only do I want them to be uh, both have the same sign, I want them to have the same sign by a margin of one. So um, if this is bigger than one, whoops. If if this uh, this thing is bigger than one, then um, then I have no loss. So this might. Uh, Assuming there is a solution, then this would have uh, many solutions um, without if we don't restrict it anymore. So we actually need to also say, um, and we want there to be a wide margin, which means we want W to be small. If you actually if you make W W smaller, that actually means you have a wider margin. Um, because it means more things will be within the margin because this product will be smaller. All right, so um, let's look at this. Uh, oh, and so basically you have, uh, again, this parameter C that trades off the data fitting term and the regularizer here. And basically, if you make C large, that means um, you care less about making the margin wide and you, make, and you care more about there not being any points within the margin. So this is the loss for having points within the margin. This is basically the loss for making the margin small. And so if you make C small, this means um, you uh, means more regularization means means you care more about the width of the margin. So here I made the margin the margin is wider, but I have a couple of points within the margin. If I turn down regularization, so um, then I care more about not having points in the margin, and I care less about making the margin very big. So this here is actually would be basically a hard margin support vector machine where there's no points within the margin. The points that are circled here are uh, all the points that are within the margin. And you can, if you go through the math, you'll actually find that um, only the points that are within the margin influence the solution. So all the points that are not circled here, if you remove them from the training set, nothing will change in the model. These points are called support vectors. And um, they basically specify the model fully. So here you can see on the right-hand side, that uh, there's only these three points that actually influence the solution, and all the rest doesn't really matter to the model. So here, this interpretation is uh, similar to the interpretation in lo um, logistic regression, where I said the regularization influences or lim limits the num Sorry, the regularization limits the influence each individual point can have. So here, if you have more regularization, you care less about whether there's points within the margin. So these points in the margin, they don't have as much influence. Whereas if you have less regularization, you care more about the points in the margin, and these three points can have a lot of influence. They can perfectly determine the whole model. So again, this is sort of how much do you care about classifying everything correctly? Um, but here, actually, you're not only caring about classifying correctly, but pushing things outside of the margin. With uh, little regularization, you want to push stuff outside of the margin a lot, so you make the margin smaller. With less regularization, you're okay with having some stuff in the margin, you make the margin wider. 
So these two models have sort of quite different um, motivations if you look at them, um, support vector machines and logistic regression. But if you look at the formulas, they're not, not that different. So here again is the comparison of logistic regression and um, the support vector machine. They, by default, let's say both have the um, L2 regularization. So for SVMs, actually, you have to put the L2 regularization in there, otherwise the model makes not really any sense. For logistic regression, you could leave it out. Let's say, let's say we have this in for both of them. Um, one second. Then um, here, this is the, the observed probability of the data, or the log loss, and this is the hinge loss, which, is, which says, um, are you within the margin or not? And these interpretations are quite different, but in the end, these functions are actually quite similar. And so, basically, the difference between logistic regression is whether you penalize your data using the blue function or the, the green function or teal function. And um, that's, um, yeah, so in practice, they actually behave very, very similarly. Uh, so what was the question? Yeah. So in those two equations, your function C is applied to both the Boston and your uh, L2 uh, machine, right? Or is no, no, this is, it's no, only applied to the front, this part. Okay, so then you can't, you can't control how much you want to analyze the oh. one? Sorry, th this is, so here, the, this is, the C does exactly the same as the alpha, only it's the inverse. So instead of having an alpha here, you have a C here. So instead of giving more weight to the L2 norm, you give less weight to the data fitting term. Okay. But then in that case, if I want to drop the L2 norm for another logistic regression, I can't do it because they only have one variable in the data fitting term. The question is how do you drop the L2 norm? And the answer is basically set C to infinity. And and yes, you can do that in uh, scikit-learn, and it works. Uh, it's like it's a little bit strange. So actually, I want to. I'm, uh, I asked uh, one of my developers to add an option that t tells you to just turn off the regularization. But behind the scenes, what it does is just it makes C be infinity, and then uh, it's the same. I mean, if you just use a very large C, it, it will just not uh, not matter. Um, I might have made a sign error. I probably have made a sign error. Yeah, there probably needs to be a minus here, but I have to check that offline because I'm bad in doing algebra in front of the class. <laughs> um, thank you for pointing this out. What's the bound on C? Could that just include the minus sign? The C no, no, C, C, sorry, C is, needs to be positive. Okay. C is a, any positive number, but it needs to be positive. If you set C equal to zero, you're not fitting the wait. You're not fitting the data anymore, uh, which would make no sense. So C is again, you would pick it uh, on like a logarithmic grid, so one, zero point one, zero zero point one, and so on. It's basically on the same scale as alpha, only it has sort of the inverted meaning. Oh yeah. Um, so for the uh, linear SVM, so as I said. Before you can usually you use the L2 norm, but you can also use the L1 norm, and again you get um, um, sparse coefficients. You, so you get some coefficients that are exactly zero, but it usually takes a little bit longer to solve. So now the question is: Should we use uh, linear SVM or logistic regression? And I think um, sort of really the main difference is logistic regression gives you a probabilistic model, which is kind of nice. Do you want a probabilistic model? Do you want to be able uh, to say what's the probability of y given x? Then you can use logistic regression. If you don't care about having a probabilistic model, just use either. In practice, there's not a lot of difference between the two, and um, it doesn't really matter. You can try both, see which works better, but um, 
there's really very little reference. If you need a compact or sparse solution, you can use um, the L1 penalty instead of the L2 penalty. The support vector machine has sort of this uh, nice property that depends only on a couple of the training points in theory. That's not really something that's very relevant in practice. So it's really, um, so I have very, I found it uh, very uh, rarely that there's a big difference between how the two behave. The question is, why do we need to know about SVMs? Maybe they work better sometimes. Uh, also, um, there, actually, there's an extension to the SVMs that we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is kernel SVMs, which are a little bit more general, and it's harder to do the same extension with logistic regression. Uh, the main reason is that I want, uh, uh, so usually, this is my interview question is that for everybody always, is explain to me what the difference between logistic regression and um, SVMs is, and usually people mar uh, draw a margin and draw uh, a sigmoid, and then I'm very disappointed. And the real difference is whether you use the log loss or the hinge loss. And that's really, yeah. I mean, and they have different motivations, but in the end, the model that you get out is very similar. But yeah, why would you use uh, SVMs in practice if you don't like to, you, don't, you never have to, and it'll not be that bad. All right. So now I want to talk about uh, doing multi-class classification. First, so we, we had binary classification so far, and so how do we extend this to multi-class? First, I want to talk about something that is a little bit of a hack, and that works for basically all models, um, which is reduction to binary classification. Let's say you have a multi-class classifier. Uh, sorry, you have a multi-class problem. So let's say you have five classes. But the only models that you have are the ones we just discussed, which are binary classifiers. You can build a multi-class model using binary classifiers by using multiple of them. And there's two ways to do this. One versus rest and one versus one. So these, as I said, this is called a reduction, a reduction in the mathematical sense that um, given any binary classifier, you can make it into a multi-class classifier using these techniques. So the way one versus rest works is assume we have four classes. Um, for each class, we build a binary classifier of this class versus the rest of the class. So we build one of class one versus the other three classes, one of class two versus the other three classes, and so on. So we have uh, n binary classifier where n is the number of classes. And each of them is trained on the whole data set. Okay, so now I have here in this case, I built four binary classifiers um, during training, and I want to make a prediction. And the prediction I make is I take a score from all of the classifiers. So in the linear case, this would be the, what's called the decision function in scikit-learn. It's just wi. There's a transpose missing. x plus bi. So i here goes over the different classifiers. So here's yeah, there would be four different Ws. Each of the different classifier would have a different W and would have a different B. And you select the one of the classifiers which has the highest score according to this. And this is your prediction. Here is an example using three classes. So here I try and three classifier. Uh, the gray line is gray points versus green and blue. The blue line is blue points versus gray and green, the green line is um, green points with this gray and blue. So I get these three classifiers. They actually, they're not only these lines, they're also the, norm, the length of the normal vector associated with the, um, this line. So that's also uh, important. And then I can, for each point in the plane, I now do the prediction, uh, which of these three classifiers has the highest response. And this gives me this, um, these linear decision boundaries. So that's one versus rest. This is the most commonly used strategy because it's pretty simple. 
There's another one, which is called uh, one versus one. In one versus one, we built a new binary classifier for each pair of classes. So let's say we have four classes again. We will build the classifier one versus two, one versus three, one versus four, two versus three, two versus four, and three versus four. So it's n times n minus one half binary classifiers. So now we actually, if the number of classes is more than three, we now have to build more classifiers. Uh, but each of them is only trained on uh, a subset of the data. In the classifier one versus two, only the data in classes one and two is used. The rest of the data is not used. Then if we want to make a prediction, we um, apply all the classifiers and each classifier basically gets a vote. So here I have six classifiers and each of them can vote for uh, one class or the other class. And I um, count how often each class was predicted and return the most commonly predicted class. So this is a heuristic. So both of these are heuristics. Um, there's like proof that show when they work, but they just generally work pretty well in practice. Uh, even without getting too much into the details of the math. Here for three classes, actually the, um, the plot looks quite similar, only now um, here this dashed line, this dashed gray and green line is a classifier that distinguishes between gray and green. This didn't use the blue data at all. Um, this line is between green and blue, and this line is between gray and blue. And um, So this is um, the predictions you get. Basically, you let, you, you let vote. So up here, um, you have two votes for the great classifier and one vote for the, here, up here, there is no vote for any other classifier. Wait, no, there's one for green here. I guess there's one for green here and one for blue here and two for gray in both places. Here, there's um, one for gray and two for blue. Here there's one for green and two for blue, so this, these are both blue. The center is a little bit weird. There's like some weird tie-breaking going on. Actually the center has a vote for each of them and the implementation that I used here uh, pick, always picks the first class and according, uh, according to the author that's a feature. Um, cool. So these are basically the two techniques we can use. We can basically use them for any, um, taking any binary classifier and creating a multi-class classifier from them. So one versus rest, you have number of classes, many classifiers. One versus one, you have number of classes times number of classes minus one half classifiers. So generally that's more classifiers. One versus rest is trained on imbalanced data sets, each of the original size. One versus one is trained on balanced subsets. Um, the one versus rest, you have, you get again, you, you get some like degree of uncertainty with it because you have this W transpose X um, plus B, which gives you like the distance from the closest hyperplane basically. Whereas in the one versus one, you have only the votes, which don't really give you a lot of uncertainty. All right, so these are sort of heuristics that you can always use. It's a little bit nicer if you can actually find the model that, uh, that supports doing multi-class classification. For support vector machines, there are such models, but they're not actually used in practice. So you can extend a support vector machine to be multi-class, and you can extend them to be like really crazy and do fancy stuff, but uh, that's not really like on Vogue anymore. Um, but for Logistic regression, it's very standard to use the extension uh, multinomial logistic regression, which is just a multi-class probabilistic model. So here we have a very similar approach um, where we model a probability of uh, y being class i uh, given x as this. There, um, this formula is actually quite related to the logic that I went before, it's again, it's e to the double, uh, w transpose x plus uh, b, and you have this uh, a w and a b for each of the classes. 
and then you normalize this by the sum of all of these over all the classes. Basically, you normalize it to the probability sum to one. This guy is called uh, the softmax, and it gives you um, basically a vector of values between zero and one that all sum to one. Given this probabilistic model, you then uh, find W and uh, B by, there's definitely a minus missing here, uh, by maximizing the log probability or minimizing the negative log probability. So yeah, there's definitely a minus missing here. Um, so once you do that, then uh, you can make predictions. Either you can predict the, or you can predict the thing with the highest probability. If you look at the formula, the thing with the highest probability is actually the thing with, which has the highest, highest uh, uh, w uh, i transpose x plus b i. And I'm missing a transpose. Great. All right. So basically here. Uh, the prediction formula is the same as for one versus rest, and you can think about this there being um, basically one hyperplane associated with each class, but you have a way to uh, jointly optimize all of them. So that's kind of nice. And so again, now you have a nice probabilistic model that gives you the probability for each of the classes. I didn't put any uh, penalty here, but so you can obviously put a C there and then add a regularizer and you can use a one or L2 regularizer. And so logistic regression can deal with this um, like directly. So talking about how these things are implemented in scikit-learn. So the one words is one. Um, right now is used only in SVC, more or less for historical reasons. So the SVC is the general support vector machine that supports kernels and linear models. I would never use it for a linear model, but for kernels you need to use it. Um, one word is rest is the default for all linear models, basically. It's even the default for logistic regression, though um, this will change in two versions. So if you want to use multinomial logistic regression, you have to set multinomial equal to true. If you don't do that, it'll tell you a warning that the behavior will change. So if you do multinomial equal to false, it will do one versus the rest. So if you want to have access to this W uh, transpose X plus B for any of the linear models, you can use the decision function. For the probabilistic models, um, so for logistic regression, you can use um, the predict proba method, and predict proba will give you p of x given y. Sorry, p of y given x, and it's going to be a vector of length, um, number of classes. Decision function will also be a vector of number of classes in the multi-class setting, and will be a single number in the a single number for each sample in the binary setting. You can also coerce uh, the support vector machine to give you probabilities. This usually doesn't work so great and it's very slow and does some magic internally. We're going to talk about this magic in like two or three weeks when we talk about calibration, but I would re uh, recommend you just don't use that uh, because yeah, it, it's not, uh, not necessarily a good way to do things. Uh, maybe very briefly, what would this look like in code? So here I'm applying um, logistic regression and linear SVC. So linear SVC is the implementation of the linear support vector machine to the iris data set. Iris data set has four features and three classes. And so here um, I specify logistic regression with multi-class equal to multinomial. Um, with changing the default solver to this. So in two versions, you don't have to specify this anymore, but it probably complains if you set multi-class to multinomial without set also setting this. And this is just uh, how it solves for W and B. So we do this 
multinomial logistic regression and the linear SVM, we fit both of them on the iris data set. And so I want to show that the coefficients are in both cases four, uh, three by four. So three are the number of classes and four is the number of input features. If you used SDC, it would actually have the same shape because uh, three times three minus one half is the same as three. Uh, but the semantics would be different. And if you want, you can visualize these uh, coefficients. So here, um, the coefficient that I said there, three by four, so there's three classes. Each has four coefficients, one for each um, feature. And here you can see um, sort of what the, um, what the model does. So this, this model basically that's, is for cetosis, it has panel widths and panel lengths should be small and sepal widths should be big. And there's a color, I mean, you can see it yourself. Yeah? So for SVC, the default is for one versus one The will always use one versus one classification. For multi-class? For multi-class, yes. So then if I have a lot of maps, then that's going to be very slow, right? Because it's all Um. Yeah, so the question is, if you have lots of classes, SVC can be very slow. Um, yes, sort of, um, but each of the models will be fitted on a subset of the data, right? So if you have um, 100 classes and let's say they're balanced, then each classifier is only uh, trained on 200 of the data set. So it's probably a little bit slow, but uh, worse. You can, if you really want to, there's uh, things in scikit-learn called one versus one classifier and one versus rest classifier. You can use them and you can wrap the SVC in that and use one versus rest. But there's not really a uh, need to do that. So before we go to uh, kernels, I want to briefly talk about some computational considerations. Um, for all the linear models. So linear models are really nice because they're really fast. They don't usually overfit. Um, big fan of linear models. Always use the linear model first. No matter what you do, if you haven't run a linear model and you show me your results, I'll ask you, what, what about a linear model? Never not run a linear model. There's never an excuse. And yeah, I might, might have said that before, but I have many times I have projects where people start building some crazy complex neural networks and never run a linear model. In the end, I tell them run a linear model and the linear model does better. So it's, usually it's not the best, but it gives you a baseline. And you should never do without that baseline. Okay, so there's lots of solver choices, which is how do you compute, uh, how do you actually do this minimization? And I haven't talked about how this minimization is done and how you do this changes every couple of years when someone comes up with a smarter way. And I actually don't think there's a lot of benefits in like knowing all the details about this, how this works. So here's just a couple of recommendations. So don't use the linear kernel in the SVC, always use linear SVC. Uh, for regression models, when the number of features much bigger than the number of samples, use uh, Lars or lasso Lars instead of lasso. If you have small sample sizes, let's say less than 10,000 feature, uh, less than 10,000 samples, don't worry, everything will be super fast. Basically, if your data is like less than 10,000 samples, everything will be instantaneous because linear models are fast. Um, if the number of samples is large and larger than the number of features, uh, try dual equal to false on linear SVC and logistic regression. So right now, basically, th there's one default setting that it always uses, and um, ideally, we would make a smart decision internally about what's the fastest way to solve, but it's actually kind of tricky, so we don't do that right now. There's not really, like, n there's very few people that do, that do research on saying, how do these behave on practical problems and when should I pick wh uh, which one? There's a lot of people who come up with new methods and write papers and say, oh, my method is much faster than all the other methods. And they're always wrong. Um, 
or they're always overselling. And so it's very hard to decide what is always the best um, choice. But so if the number of samples is big uh, and bigger number of features, try to rule equal to false. If the number of samples is quite big, let's say millions, uh, tens of millions of data points, there is a software called SAG, um, which is really nice. Um, and it should be very fast for very big sample sizes. It's very important for this one to scale your data though. And if your sample size is really, really large, you can use stochastic gradient descent. There's SGD classifier and SGD regressor. So if you have like a billion data points, maybe use that. Um, these recommendations are more or less also in the scikit-learn documentation, so in particular the I think the logistic regression talks quite in depth about what solvers to pick, what are the different choices between the solvers um, for different data set sizes and for different penalties. Oh yeah, just to, for the SAC solver, you just have to do the standard scalar. Basically, if you don't do standard scalar, it's not gonna converge and we're not gonna warn you for some reason. Um. Cool, other questions? All right, I mean, the next nice thing is, these really only matter, like, these are all very robust and they will always work, so this is way less finicky than doing neural networks. And um, so basically, if you just do the default logistic regression, it'll always be fine. Um, if you have tons of data, if you tweak the options, you can get a bit faster. But it will always be fine, basically. All right, so now let's talk about kernel SVMs. So basically, um, so these have become uh, way less popular in the last couple of years, but it's still sort of good uh, to know about them because people will use them and sometimes they work quite well. It's not really my go-to model uh, anymore. Um, people these days much more use random forest and gradient boosting, which we'll talk about next week. So the idea is that we said for linear models, um, the complexity of the model is very much dictated by the input features. And if you can't uh, find a hyperplane in the original feature space, um, a linear model might not be able to classify something well. We also saw maybe we can add some more features, we can add polynomials, construct some interactions, and um, then maybe we can get a more complex model by adding new features in. The idea between the um, kernel SVMs is basically to somewhat automate this um, feature expansion and go implicitly to a higher dimensional space without actually having to construct the features. In a sense, this is a somewhat similar motivation to, um, support to neural networks. We are also trying to automate the feature extraction process. The difference is that in support vector machines, you keep the convexity, which is basically you have a simple optimization problem. This means you this is, means you basically, you're not learning the features. There's just a sort of a fixed way to extract the features in like a fancy way. The, um, for that reason, it's still easy to optimize. Neural networks learn feature extraction, which arguably is maybe more flexible, but then your optimization problem becomes very hairy and you have these like uh, non-convex optimization and then you have to deal with like learning rates and atom and terrible things. All right, so let's go back to the linear SVM for a second. So this was the optimization problem. And um, if you do some um, fancy optimization theory, then you can find that if you do this minimization, this um, W vector will actually be a linear combination of the training data points and um, by some alphas. These alphas are called the dual coefficients. These are non-zero only for the support vectors. So I said the uh, 
the solution only depends on the support vectors. So the, the uh, W can be expressed as a linear combination of the support vectors with these coefficients alpha. They have nothing to do with the alpha and rich regression. They're just also called alpha. Then, um, assuming I, I know these alphas, uh, I can rewrite the prediction as um, the sign of this. So I replace the W transpose X by the sum over the alphas in the XI, where the XI are training points. And then for my new data point X, I have to compute these uh, inner products uh, weighted by alpha i, and then I compute the sign, and this is my classification outcome. Um, by the way, so one can show that these alphas are always limited by c, so this is what I meant by the um, c limits the amount of influence of each data point. It actually look exactly limits this alpha in a linear combination. All right, so, but the takeaway here is that we can uh, write this um, outcome of the classification using the dual coefficients at inner products. And we don't really need to have this coefficient vector w. So now, instead of doing this in the original space, we could replace xi by some features of xi, which I call phi. So let's say these are like some fancy features you created, some polynomial expansion or some interactions or whatever fancy thing you, you were thinking about. And um, then you can see that um, y hat is just the combination of the alpha i and the inner products of the feature vectors. And you can see that uh, well, or if you go through the math, you can see the optimization problem to finding the alphas also only depends on these inner products of the feature vectors. So now comes what is called the kernel trick, which is basically saying, well, instead of actually worrying about what are these feature vectors that we want to create, we can just create um, something that behaves like an inner product, and, um, which is called the kernel. And this kernel basically is uh, the inner product in some space. And so instead of writing feature functions down, we can now write down something that's like a similarity measure between two data points. And actually, there's a theorem that guarantees if um, the k is positive, definite, and symmetric, which means k applied between two points, oh, sorry, k applied with the same point twice is positive, and k xi xj is the same as k xj xy, then there's always such a phi. So basically, you can come up with um, some crazy function k that measures similarities, and there's always a function phi that um, is the feature function that gives you these inner, inner products. But you never have to actually compute this feature function, and you com come up with a case that corresponds to infinite dimensional uh, feature functions. And actually, these are quite common. So what are some examples of these kernels? So the simplest kernel is the linear kernel, which is just the inner product in the original space. That's just the linear SVM. Um, other common kernels are the polynomial kernel, which is uh, between two um, axes is x transpose times x prime. So this is just the inner product plus some constant c to the power of d. And we'll see why this is called the polynomial kernel. But I mean, there's already like some exponent. There's the RBF kernel, the radial basis function kernel, which is basically just a Gaussian window with some Gaussian bandwidth, inverse Gaussian bandwidth gamma. Um, so here we do x of gamma times the distance between x and x prime squared. Um, this is probably the most commonly used kernel in nonlinear squared vector machines. 
So that's a, a, often called the RBF kernel support vector machine. And there are some other kernels that are like less commonly used, for example, um, a sigmoid kernel, where you use 10H. Um, and this is related to neural networks, or like this is called the um, intersection kernel, which is just component-wise the minimum between Xi and Xi prime. You can come up with any number of more kernels. Um, and if you have two kernels, you can add them and get a new kernel. You can make the product and get a new kernel. You can uh, take them, uh, multiply them by the scala number. So any kind of different combinations of kernels are new kernels. Another thing that's nice about kernels is you can make kernels between things that are not numbers. So you can do support vector machines to classify, say, graphs by defining a graph on kernels or on strings or on images or on whatever you come up with. Instead of defining feature functions, you can define these similarities. And for graphs, for example, maybe defining the similarity between two graphs is easier than defining a feature for a graph. All right, so now I hope I can make this a little bit more clear by looking at the polynomial kernel and comparing the polynomial kernel versus polynomial features. So here, this is the polynomial kernel. Um, so now I can do the kernel support vector machine with this kernel, and the outcome will actually be quite similar than if I do an explicit expansion. So let's say that um, I expand my features instead. So instead of having my original feature x and x prime, let's say these are, I have only a single feature x, and uh, so I have two points x and x prime, and I expand the feature space now to also include the square, a constant one, and actually square root of two times x, which is basically the original feature only square root times two. But bear with me with this. So if I take this new feature expansion, this explicit feature expansion, which is very similar to what we did, we just adding the square. If I take the inner products in this space, I can multiply out the inner product, and I get this guy, which is x square x prime square plus two, uh, two x x prime plus one, which is exactly this, which is x uh, x prime plus one squared. So this is, so the inner product with these feature vectors corresponds exactly to um, using this kernel function. And if I do this for higher d, this corresponds to um, higher degree polynomials. So if I want very high degree polynomials, this might be nice because um, if I create these feature vectors, these feature vectors might become very large, um, but this kernel function will always be like very compact, right? I just, it doesn't matter if I take something to the uh, third or the tenth power, it's a very simple com uh, computation instead of uh, creating a very big feature space. It's not exactly the same as you can see, there's like this square root of two in here that's different from just adding the square, but it's like very, very similar. And so here I come, uh, on the left-hand side, I did a kernel support vector machine with a polynomial kernel. On the right-hand side, I did polynomial features and then fit a linear SVM. And um, they're not entirely the same, but they're very close. And I circled the things that are the support vectors. And this one is not a support vector in the features, but it is with the kernel. But you can basically, the, the solutions are quite similar. And um, so maybe to understand the solution for the kernel SVM a little bit better, uh, I want to relate the linear SVM to the kernel SVM again. So in the linear SVM, this was, uh, so I did this uh, feature expansion. Oh, so here I had, um, two feature input features, the x and the y axis. So after the feature expansion, I have five features, x0, x1, x0 squared, x0, x1, x1 squared. So 
I went from the original two-dimensional feature space to five-dimensional feature space, and did a linear model in the five-dimensional feature space. So here I have these five coefficients. And so the prediction function that I get is um, just this coefficient times x0, this coefficient times x1, this coefficient times x0 squared, this coefficient times x1, x0, this coefficient times x1 squared. So this is just plugging in the polynomial feature into, um, into this. I can actually, in this linear SVM, also look at the dual coefficients. Um, so this guy had like these four support vectors, and I can express the solution in terms of these four support vectors. If I look at the dual coefficients and at the support vectors, what I see is the support vectors are 1, 26, 42, and 62. So these are indices in the training data set. And the dual coefficients are these values. So the first two are negative, meaning they're associated with class minus 1. The second two are positive, meaning they're associated with the class plus 1. And so now I can um, rewrite uh, this thing. So this is more or less called the primal form, where basically I use w. And I can express it exactly the same thing as um, a function of the feature vectors. So here I have, oh, it was 0, not, it was 1, not 0. Let's say, so here I had, zero, uh, had minus 0 0.03 times uh, the first support vector times the features of the input uh, point. So here what I'm doing is I I had this uh, formula for W as expressed as a linear combination using alpha and data points, and that's what I'm plugging in here. So these are the alphas, and these are the feature vectors for my uh, data points. For so I had uh, training data point 1, 26, 42, and uh, 63. And so if you compute these, these two numbers would be exactly the same. So this, this up here and this down here would be the same. Only the bottom is like somewhat a more complicated way to th write things down it, uh, in the case where I have the explicit features. But the second one, way to write things down, is much closer to what you do with the kernel. So in, for the kernel version, where I use the polynomial kernel, I don't actually, there is no W. This W doesn't really exist. But I still have the dual coefficients, and I still have the support vectors. I still actually have the same support vectors. I also got the uh, 42, which I didn't have before. And these are the um, coefficients. And so now, instead of um, having the feature vectors in here, I have the kernel. So now I take the kernel of the new data point with um, my training data point 1 times minus 0 0.057. Then I have the next, or just actually have S0, so I'm going to ignore it. And then for 41, it has minus uh, 0 0.012. Um, and so here, now instead of the inner products in the feature space, I have the kernels. But the formula is like very similar. And so um, if you have a very large feature space, computing this might be much faster. So this is the main motivation for doing kernels, say, in a polynomial case. If you do something like RBF kernels, if you use these Gaussian uh, window functions, then the feature space is actually infinite dimensional. So in this case, you could never write down this um, uh, feature expansion phi, really. And so you can only do the kernels. Um, looking at runtimes, this is the same plot, one on a log scale and one not on a log scale. And you can see that um, if the number of samples is very large, then uh, doing the explicit features is faster. If the number of samples is small, then doing the kernel is faster. If I did the same thing with number of features, if, you have, if basically if you have lots of features and few samples, then kernels are fast. If you have lots of samples and few features, and features are fast. So, 
using kernels, maybe one of the issues is these dual coefficients are less interpretable. They basically tell you how much to weight the inner product with the train data point, which is maybe if there's like, often there's many support vectors. If you have like a thousand support vectors, how are you gonna explain this to your boss? I don't know. Um, if you have, let's say, 100,000 samples or more, these things tend to get a bit slow um, because you have to compute, bas basically you have to compute the kernel function between each pair of training points. Yeah, and the really cool thing basically is working with infinite dimensional feature spaces like the RBF kernel. RBF is what's called a, a universal kernel which can learn anything, meaning it can overfit anything. So if you have, a, no matter what um, your data set uh, is, like a linear function only was very, very limited in what it could fit, an RBF kernel, can, uh, support vector machine, can learn anything. <coughs> it doesn't mean it can generalize, but it can fit anything perfectly. So these kernels usually use inner you know, products or distances, so it's important that you scale. Um, the gamma parameter in the RBF kernel, so we'll talk about the RBF kernel a bit more, it directly relates to the scaling of the data and the number of features. The new default for gamma in scikit-learn will be one over standard deviation of x uh, times the number of features, but that's because I made a square root error, and actually what it should be is one over the variance uh, of x times the number of features. So don't trust the new default value, which we're gonna change again. But basically what you want is, the easiest way to work with this is scale your data, and then set gamma around one over number of features. So all of these models have basically uh, hyper the hyperparameters C for regularization and then any hyperparameters associated with the kernel. So the polynomial the kernel had mostly the degree. Um, the RBF kernel has this parameter gamma, which basically is the bandwidth of the kernel. And yeah, this bandwidth, so this is directly related to the scale of the data. Um, so as a reminder, this is the RBF kernel, and basically if gamma is very big, you get a very broad bandwidth. If, sorry, if gamma is very small, you get a broad bandwidth. If, if gamma is very big, you get a very narrow bandwidth. And so if you um, use a high gamma, that means the kernel cares only upon points that are very close. With the broader, you care upon points that are further away. Um, so the high gamma is sort of a more, more complexity you can fit more things. Here's an, uh, illustrating this on my favorite GD data set. Excuse me. Um, so here on the, in these plots, the rows are different values of C and the columns are different values of gamma. So the simplest model is top left, the most complex model is bottom right. And so, and I said C controls the influence that all the data points can have, or that each individual data point can have. The, the circle points are the support vectors. You can see here, everything is a support vector. And you have basically a straight line. If you increase uh, C here, um, basically we've perfectly fit the training data set. We now only have um, four, uh, four support vectors. So we have less support vectors, they can have more, uh, more influence on the decision boundary, and we get this guy. Um, so here, gamma is 0 0.01, so we only, we have like very broad curves. If we make uh, gamma a little bit bigger, we get sort of more wiggly curves. And so um, here, these look very similar, but um, we basically allow there to be more flexibility and if we make gamma even bigger, you can see that there's basically each individual uh, training data point makes like a bump in the decision boundary. And so here, these are sort of less smooth than this. And this is basically overfit because, um, well, I, I would assume it's a red here, but actually the classifier says it's blue. 
because they very tightly fit the red data points. So, problem, so there's um, an interaction between the seed and gamma. Both of them control complexity. And so um, smaller gamma and smaller C mean less complex models. Higher gamma, higher C mean more complex models, but in a different sense. Okay, before I let you go, I'll um, show you some grid search results on the digits data set. I'm not sure if we actually had this so far. It's handwritten digits. It's, um, we have six, 64 features, which are eight times eight grayscale images. And so here I'm um, grid searching on, um, maybe I put it somewhere. So basically I'm using a pipeline of a standard scalar in SVM and um, I'm grid searching the pipeline with uh, C and gamma both on a logarithmic scale. Um, and that here basically I use minus three to six, uh, minus three to two, and I divided this by the number of features. Um, then I do grid search CV here, and the outcome looks something like this. So, Uh, here in the x-axis is gamma and the y-axis is c and you can see there's a pretty strong interaction and um, What I find quite interesting here is the so this is a 10 class classification data set which is balanced so chance performance is 10% and So if you set the parameters wrong you end up in this blue area and you basically get chance performance if you set them correctly you get a performance that's like 99% so the difference between having a terrible classifier and a near-perfect classifier is setting the gamma parameter and the C parameter correctly. And you can see there's several good, good values. And basically, um, if you set gamma correct, then uh, it doesn't matter so much which C you use, um, unless you add too much regularization. All right, I'm already over time, so that's it for today.